This is the Kingrune KLP1, a solidly built, enclosed, clipper-enabled CoreXY 3D printer for only 379 bucks. I think it could be the next Ender 3 in the Core XY generation, so grab yourself a cuppa and let's have a chat about this printer. Straight out of the gate, this is a good printer, and I would recommend it for all of you tinkerers out there. It does have a few quirks and things can and should be better, but man, it is awesome to see that we're starting to get so much printer for our buck nowadays. An affiliate link for this printer is linked in the description if you would like to support what I'm doing here. Before I go much further, a little disclosure. This printer was provided to me for free to review and everything you're about to hear are my own thoughts. If you want to take a look at my full review guidelines, they are linked down in the description. So first, the must knows. It has a build volume of 210 by 210 by 210. However, that does include the little purge line on the side. So just be aware of that. It is an all metal hot end with a ceramic heating block with a max temp of 300 degrees. It uses linear rails on the X and Y and a solid ball and screw system for the Z. The build plate is spring steel textured PEI sheet and it does the automatic bed leveling with an inductive proximity sensor. Okay, with all of that out of the way, starting it all off, this printer comes well packaged and pretty much fully assembled. All that's left to do is to add the acrylic panels and follow the startup guide. If you want to take a look at all of that in a lot more detail, take a look at my Tech Funds unboxing video, which you can go and take a look at once we're done here. <laughs> right out of the box and all set up, which by the way, literally consists of a simple calibration with the input shaper and a mesh bed leveling. Then straight away, I put on the pre-sliced standard Benchy that comes with the Kingroon KLP1. It took 25 minutes to print, plus three or so minutes to heat up from cold, and the results aren't that bad. I then put on their pre-sliced, quote, violently fast version of the Benchy, which took a total of 18 minutes. Now, yeah, 18 minute print time is not exactly going to win any awards, but it's looking pretty good. The only thing that really stands out to me from these first initial prints is that the far side of the Benchy needs some better cooling. And that does not surprise me, considering that the only thing cooling a print down is a single sided blower. Right, now that we have some prints done, let's actually do an overview. Do keep in mind that I've only had this printer for just over a week. However, I have pretty much had it printing 24 seven. So these are my initial thoughts and I can't really speak in terms of longevity. Personally, I think it looks awesome. It's a nice sleek design and it's pretty much all metal. And I really do mean all metal from the frame to the extruder head, to the gantry, to the spool holder which means that it comes in at a hefty 14 kilograms. The footprint is 400 by 430 by 430. And when you're printing PLA and you have that screwed on door open, it's another 300 millimeters out. You'll also see that it has a 3.5 inch touchscreen. And that is where we're going to start the part of the review where I point out the questionable design decisions, starting with that screen. Okay. It's a 3.5 inch full color resistive touchscreen. Don't get me wrong, it's great to have a full color screen and it seems to be a pretty nice resolution. But why is it a resistive touchscreen? That means that eventually it's going to degrade and it has one of the worst possible viewing angles for it and it's almost impossible to see in the sunlight. But at least with that nice, decent resolution, King Rune is using the nice detailed clipper screen UI. But we need to remember that this is only a 3.5 inch screen. So that UI can sometimes be tiny. So much so that if you have nice chunky fingers like mine, you pretty much have to exclusively use the included stylus to interact with that screen. And of course, knowing me, I'm going to misplace this stylus all of the time. But at least they thought of that and gave me a nice way to attach it to the printer with this little springy cord. 
Anyway, taking a step back, I also have to question why the screen is on the inside of the enclosure. Speaking of which, why did they have to use such a dark acrylic? Yeah, I get it. It looks cool. But now I can't see my prints printing or check my first layers. I can hardly see the screen, not to mention interact with it, because what if I'm printing some sort of trickier material? I don't want to let that heat out. I know, to combat that, there is Wi-Fi enabled in all of this lovely goodness, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but still, it seems like a little bit of an oversight. Oh, and lastly, if we're going to go with a dark look, at least add some LED lights inside of that, because at this very moment, it's basically a dark void. Anyway, unfortunately, I do have one more thing to say about these acrylic covers. More specifically, that top cover. For the life of me, I don't understand why it is so close to the extruder. In fact, it is so close that it forces down the extruder cable and the Bowden tube, making it do a sharp turn into the extruder. I'm sure I don't have to exactly tell you why that's a bad idea, but in a nutshell, it adds needless excess friction inside of the Bowden tube, which could lead to under extrusion at times. And while I'm doing manual filament changes, I always seem to get the filament stuck right at that bend. Now, on top of that, it is also going to be wearing out the extruder cable while it's rubbing on the top of that enclosure. Yes, it might be slowly but surely, but it's happening. Plus, on top of all of that, the lid can go all the way back at no point stopping, and then it rests on top of the spool because of the filament holder. <sighs> Lastly, while we're out here, let's talk about two more design-wise things and that is the exhaust and the back of the printer, where you're going to find that lovely spool holder as well as that filament runout sensor. So exhaust-wise, basically, it comes out of the bottom and a little bit out from the side. And as you can see, this thing has some, well, very little feet, so don't expect to put this down on any type of carpeted surface and expect it to constantly be trying to cool itself down. It has a standing hum, while it's not printing, of 47 decibels and quite a noisy 60 decibels while printing with the door open and 53 decibels with the door shut. Now to the backside. I swear, <laughs> this, this is a good printer. It's just most of the downsides I found are in the overall design. Just hold on just a little bit longer. So yeah. Here on the back, as you can see, you have the lovely filament sensor and you also have the spool holder, which again, I have to ask, what on earth were they thinking? Most crucially, why is the spool holder so high up and so small? Being so high up, no matter which way you feed that filament into the filament sensor, it's taking a bit of a, a weird path. So, that means that if you have any type of brittle filament, good luck. And if your filament is just a little bit abrasive, bye-bye sensor. Now, with the spool holder being so small, very few spools actually fit on it. Of course, the King Rune filament does fit on it, but past that, far and few between. Out of the 10 brands of filament I have at hand at the moment, only three fit on that spool filament spool holder. Now finally, let's talk about the results. Overall, there is not many things to say or point out when it comes to printing. It's a very solidly built printer with a few design flaws, and yes, it prints quite noisily, but it prints PLA, ABS, and PTG with no issue at all. It pretty much does what it says on the tin once you find the profiles for it. That's right. That was my number one pain with this printer. I just didn't get any profiles or hardly anything. The USB I received with the printer came with one PLA profile for Prusa, Orca, and Cura Slicer. Not only that, but honestly, they were a mess. 
I was getting wildly different results from each slicer, everything from over extrusion to under extrusion to poor top layers. One slicer was even giving me an entire hour longer of a print on the exact same file. Not to mention that it was for only PLA and it was at a very conservative speed. So I sent an email and in reply, I got sent back a blog post that had some updated profiles for Orca Slicer. And that honestly did do the trick. PLA, ABS, and PTG profiles that are not perfect by any means, but do work. With that said, they're slow. The PLA profile estimates a Benchy at 45 minutes. And as we've seen, it can definitely go faster than that. Anyway, from there, I really put the printer through its paces. First layer tests, bridging tests, you name it. Overall, it's doing an okay job. The long and the short of it is that I see the potential of this printer, but I'm not about to spend a week or two tweaking for some custom profile for this review to show it off to you guys. Great profiles should come as standard for a printer. And that there is the biggest drawback for the King Room KLP1 currently. It is severely lacking profiles. And I know once the community grows around this printer, and once I've had it for a few more weeks, I'm going to be able to tune this into a powerhouse of a printer. But still, the point still stands. Now, there are a few other things that I want to mention. Firstly, this has been one of the easiest Wi-Fi enabled printers I've ever used in my life. All I had to do was connect it to my Wi-Fi, give it a quick restart, and right away I was able to connect it via the IP address shown on the screen. No accounts, no nothing, just a straight up Clipper web interface. That was beautiful. For those of you that have never used something like this, just know that it's lovely to be able to send prints and control everything of your printer on the fly. You can even connect a webcam directly to the KPL1 and do remote viewing. Now, speaking of that web interface, you probably are going to need it, or at least it's the easiest way to change the pressure advanced settings of the printer via the config files. Oh, and the it comes preloaded with a pressure advanced line test, which is always nice to see. Now, a few other things to give you a heads up on is that the input shaper calibration is loud. And I'm talking loud, 69 decibels loud. As well, as you can imagine, as it's all metal, it has some pretty powerful stepper motors in there. So expect there to be some noise coming from this. Also, the auto filament unload sort of sucks for two reasons. One, it doesn't actually unload the filament all the way. And two, right after the unload operation, it instantly tries to cool down that nozzle. And there is no way of canceling that cooling procedure. Well, none that I could find anyway. So you're sort of just left there waiting for it to cool down to then heat it back up to feed in your next filament. In the end, I usually just do it manually. However, if you do do that, that is do it manually, when you're setting up the temperatures, just be sure that it is only the nozzle that you're changing and not accidentally changing the temperature for the pie fan and your bed, as by default, these are also selected. It's one of the downsides of having a lovely clipper UI. You get given all of the power that the printer can do, but that also means the responsibility of being sure you know what you're changing and where. So yeah, just a heads up on that one. Now, something else a little bit strange that I wanna be sure you're aware of while you're looking at reviews of the KPL1 is that there seems to be an older version which came out about five months ago. Now that version does not seem to have a screen Plus, it has quite a few other issues. If you want to see an example of what I'm talking about, it's linked down in the description. It seems that King Room was just not happy with those issues and have now pulled that version completely off of the market and replaced it with this new version, 
with the exact same name. So just be sure that you're looking at reviews of the updated version, which from what I can see, has only been out a couple of weeks from the release of this video. So with that all said and done, I think you can see why I both love and dislike this printer. It does have some pretty major design flaws, but pretty much all of those flaws, creative makers like us will be able to address them in some way or another. Now, yes, I know King Rune should have addressed these issues before putting the printer out on the market, for sure. But, oh well, this is where what we have now. In fact, I've already designed and replaced this filament spool holder with this here and it's working just perfectly. Next, it will probably be a different lid, if any, because I, in truth, pretty much just print PLA. So I would rather have that front door just shut and then without the lid at all, it just lets the excess heat ventilate out the top. Then I'll probably add a couple of LEDs here and there, some bigger feet, some quiet fans, and a whole lot of profile tweaking. And before you know it, at 379 bucks, it's going to be a steal of a deal for what it is. With that being said, this by no means is a plug and play machine, mainly due to the lack of decent profiles. And if you do nothing, it's eventually going to break down due to the rubbing of that cable on the top of the enclosure. However, this printer is a tinkerer's paradise. I really do see this as the new Ender 3 of the Core XY generation. What do you think? Am I missing something obvious? Let me know in the comments below or over in the Discord. And if there are any other tests that you would like me to do with this printer, let me know and I'll make a YouTube short of it and then link them all down in the description of this video. Anyway, thank you for watching and keep making.